Okay, Dave, let's start from the very beginning. Where did you grow up? Tell us a bit about your family. Okay, well, I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia. My dad was in the United States Navy, so we slept all over the place because of that. Um, we lived for several years up in Newfoundland, Canada, and I started school over there, and I consider myself part Canadian because it was so young in my life that we moved up there. It was almost like I was born there, but so I've got a very Canadian friendly, friendliness to me. So, um, in 1957, we moved to California, lived in various parts of the state. So I've been out there ever since, and I love California. I love Northern California and Southern California. I don't participate in any of that rivalry because I live all state. Compared to your coming out to the uh, to the Russian Revolution, how was that? Was in one of the interviews I read in the archives. Okay, let's see how the Russian Revolution was. It was sudden. The Russian Revolution wasn't sudden. When I came out as gay, um, I don't think gay or just, but I was never in an environment where there were masculine gay people. We always thought it was you know, like football in high school. We're making fun of the real vanilla ones, which are super vanilla. That was that, okay? And I had an attraction to guys. But I never related it to vanilla. So you have people in the audience who had so many of them in leather with the masculine and the things. So when it hit, I was going to all the whole Baptist thing and all these other things. I was a very conservative Republican. I mean, you know, I got to read meet Richard Nixon as a Republican, you know, and, and all the whole very conservative side. So I deal with all that. And when the coming out moment came, all this hit. Then I was seeing all the things and the damages that were being done and the injustices of people who I was meeting and seeing all the stuff that was happening to them. All of a sudden, I was going to become victim of because I was opening myself up to that. It was a great awakening is what it was. It was a sudden, great awakening. So tell us a little bit about your early days in Gaeta, your early gay days. Okay, well, I was, I was living in, uh, in Toro, which is up about 60 miles west of Los Angeles. And uh, I was never coming to LA. Uh, when I came out, uh, I came across a copy of The Advocate. And The Advocate back then was a, to compare it close to what's if you are familiar with the Bay Area Reporter looks like now, where there's some color in it, two sections to it. The advocate came out once every two weeks, and then when it was rival came out in Auburn in weeks, two weeks called News West. But I got the advocate, and of course, this big world's opening up. I'm trying to find everything out about it that I could. And I saw about some of the other bars. Those looked interesting. So both of us right down to the Larry's, and I'm showing up there as wingtip, black pants, nice dress shirt, and a little bit. I went in three or four times. I was the guy who would never let in a leather bar. <laughs> and I had a message, and then I had rest, and I addressed this in a few of my editorials too. That guy coming in to the leather bar who was wearing tin, the stereotypical tin shoes, a little bit, that people reject. How you deal with that person can direct his life and your life That's true. and the life of your friends. The first impression, A, you push the guy away, get out of here, we don't want you to look like slow, we don't want you to be here, you know, they leave. Okay, angry, left. They hear the things stuff, leather people beat people, leather people hurt people. They felt abused in a little bit of contact. Okay, they're coming out to do it like this. They get involved with the pride committee. The leather group wants to put flow in gay parade. Guess who's on the committee? It came back to you. That's one way. Even if you just leave the person alone, it's one thing to don't go up and abuse them. Share with them. Oh, that's like this. Drop a hint to them. Because nobody did drop that hint. I mean, you get off and start seeing the guy. And then when I got what I needed to get in time. But how that person dealt with it, 
You don't know if they're going to run a weather journal or who they're going to be. They might run a club, they might be your next IML, they might be a complete idiot, too. You don't know that. But give them the chance and the opportunity to share that with them. It's obvious that they don't know. You don't have to tell them they don't know because they're in like that. They could just come off of work. They could be just coming out. You don't know that. So approaching, you talk about trust, honor, and respect. Respectful of where they're at and bring them in. We all have a starting point. Everybody has a story in here. And every one of the stories are different. Not just the fact that it's different, but how long it took. How long were you there before it dawned on you? So there's a whole lot of factors to consider in that. And we talk about bringing in the new people and the young people. Well, there's some older people coming in like that, too. It's the people in initial contact. How we handle the initial contact, regardless of how old or young they are, what they look like, or what race they are. Give them a chance. So tell us a little bit about the leather community you knew when you came out. Okay, when I came out, okay, uh, I've been going in the bars for about seven years. There's only two or three times I went in the Larry's because of all the dungeon equipment and everything. Um, it was one of the bars in Hollywood. When in that I got the clue and started to wear jeans and at least a t-shirt, something at least would get you in and get conversation. It took seven years before somebody came up because I was the guy standing <coughs> at the wall. I was that wallflower for seven years. Somebody came up to you. It took seven years. Most people don't have the patience that I have. Maybe I'm just going to keep going at it and going at it. Eventually, things are going to wear away. But um, so for seven years, I did that. Just did that. Wondering in there and hoping to get lucky and never get lucky. Eventually, somebody did. Well, I went to one of this guy's New Year's Eve parties he invited me to. From there, I met another guy named Chuck who invited to be one of the clubs. And it joined a club called the Samandros. And there were uh, four clubs. Samandros was the first of the gay men's SM clubs in LA. And there's like four of them at the time. And they all were four, and I think like within maybe three months of each other. It was uh, Samandros and I think Avatar after that. And the only one that was remaining was Avatar, which has one of the members in the terrific club. But that's where I uh, started in that. From my journalism background, I ended up getting a job with Frontiers, which was, was LA's gay paper in the mid-80s. And I built their advertising department for them. While I was doing the ad department, uh, the publisher of the paper allowed us to use some of the equipment at Frontiers to put out this leather publication. The club, this club named Avatar put out um, a small publication of like 11 by 17 folds and a half. So the game two and that by the pages to make it a center fold. It was called, I think it was called Chain Link. And they sold that in stores. Was the idea, okay, we had drummers, drummer was great, but this was a lot of drummers, a lot of the fantasy, the images of what, the hot stories, the hot photos, a little bit of the news was in there. And I said, you know, we have the gay community as we the advocate, we have Years of Bay Area reporter in San Francisco, and I hadn't been out here, so I wasn't familiar with it out here. But in the country, there were tons of gay publications with the news. And I said, well, you know, we're kind of lacking that. Turner helps us a little bit, but that's not what their focus is. That's not their purpose. There is nothing doing that. So I just started to come out with that and a little bit of support the community who got that started. And it started out with an emphasis on the clubs. And it was, I'd say, about a year and a half after we got that out, they made it to my first IML. And through the contest, this time I've been able to travel, because I've never had money in a magazine without a money maker. I have a master at making things work with almost nothing. <laughs> and, you know, living in an apartment rent control and doing it out of my apartment is substitute for revenue when it's not there. So it does need revenue. Not a lot that does that. So, through the title system, I was able to get it to my email. When I brought it out to judge some of the things, they're helping me out with the airfare and hotel, because I don't have the money to do that. I'd love to come. I'd love to be in a position where I could say, fine, I'll be there. You know, 
But so the tribal system enabled me to get out to meet other people, and deal with the clubs, and other situations that cover that. Right now, they're going to have a contest. I wanted to meet the other people as well. So tell us a little bit about the beginnings of the Mother Journal. What things did you cover? How did you manage to bring that paper to some sort of focus? We covered primarily the club events. Um, we started a club directory, well, just like three or four issues in. We got a listing of clubs, and it wasn't email addresses and websites, but <coughs> physical addresses and phone numbers if they were to give a phone number out. Often would be like a hotline that you could call so nobody would be you know, or when you give me phone, phone, phone numbers. That was primarily where it went. I mean, there, there were a lot of runs. There was a time in LA, and when I had come out, like in 76 when I come out, and even to the early days of the Leather Journal, there was, a, there was a time when, from St. Patrick's Day, all the way to the first weekend of October, there was a motorcycle run in Southern California. That's quite a bit of time. There's plenty of clubs. So clubs like, uh, let's say the Little Ox would do a run of their own. Well, and the Warriors might do a run. The Saviors, people could have said, the of Saviors was built this weekend. And they're going to be showing a movie tonight or tomorrow. Did they show that last night or is that tonight? You know? I don't know. It's tonight. But that's one of the primarily visibilities. There's like four of the white clubs left in LA. And one that was a white club kept the MC on it. It's now a men's club because there's no motorcycles in the club. When the Lemon Joe came out, there was like about 12 or 13 white clubs. And that was half of what had been there five or six years before. So in the weekends, you got 13 clubs and more than 13 weeks of the clubs. Clubs would do their own run, but they would do joint runs to, to put another run on. So just about every weekend, there was an event to go to. This is something I could drive to or get brought to, so it was in my realm, and this was getting in. Meanwhile, people were fighting about the leather jump from these runs taking them back home, getting their clubs, sending their information to it, and it grew, the scope grew. Then I would get invited somewhere, like Salt Lake, I got invited up to, uh, you don't think of Salt Lake? It was much of a leather place. They had a club called the Wasatch Motorcycle Club. They owned their own clubhouse, seven blocks away from Temple Square, which is at a German <laughs> church. They had a series of bungalows, just like four or five bungalows. And underneath that, they had like a tunnel way and they had dungeon space. You know, guys live in this, and they owned that outright. They earned it, they were paying on it, they were laying payments, they owned that outright. This was a Cubs place, it's a great community unity they had there. So getting to see places like that. Also going to be a part of the Hellfire. I remember Hellfire Club before I started. Associate member, not a full member. Associate membership and help buyers. Not, it's not like a back patch club where you can just say, well, join this club at some $25. You have to get invited into the club. So an associate member, while it is that name, has more, you're still going with many full members of your other clubs. Help buyers got a, a situation, many keep clubs within the range of the Chicago area. The full members do the voting. But they rely on associates like volunteering and and things like that. It's an incredible club. Well, <clears throat> I read that you and the late Mr. Marcus are the Luella Parsons and the head of Hopler of the um, <laughs> leather community. Can you tell us a bit about why that's the case? Are we talking about the feud? Well, you may address it however you want to do that. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, we did. We did. Get each other back and forth. I had a sense of humor in the Leather Journal, and Marcus had his humor. Well, one time we, we had this section in the Leather Journal called Title Over Times, and it was a spoof on the title system. We just peed off on it. And then we had, um, like, we made a movie at for about um, uh, Prisoner of Zenda. Remember the movie Prisoner of Zenda? Well, the, uh, Lenny had just become a cop in San Francisco. So we made a movie poster-like ad, a big ad, like a movie poster, 
just like the one you said. It was called Prisoner of Brando. <laughs> yeah. So we had humor like that. We had um, something called Title or Time Section, and it would start off, there would be a, the sentence would just finish, and there'd be some kind of innuendo in that. They had a bunch of gossip type stuff in there. Then the last paragraph, we just continue on page 2921. I'm going to put the kid and Mr. Marcus in there, and I had an assistant editor working with me. I put a little bar of Kitty Marcus. Okay, well, my assistant editor put four or five bars in there. So it wasn't like one little thing, it was like throwing about 20 hand grenades at him. But you're going to take differently when it's one little bar, when this bombardment comes from the letter journal. Okay, so he said something was all done and fun. But I didn't know how much of my job as editor, so I was responsible for people that all the way to say it. That got that part of the start. Well, Marcus, of course, threw something back. Then we kid him. Then we got a little nasty. The mission was funny, but then it got to be harmful. And um, we did a lot of damage. Both of us did. I did things wrong. He did things wrong. People in the letter community were taking sides. Should we ask Marcus out to be a judge? Oh, I don't know what Marcus said about Dave Rose. I thought that was completely unfair. Well, then somebody else says, let's bring Dave Rhodes out. Well, no, no, he said, well, Marcus, too. And yada, yada, yada. So we had unknowingly created signs out in the community. It got to a point where people would call me up. Did you hear what Mr. Marcus said about you? Boom. Same person. Get on the phone and call Mr. Marcus. Did you hear what Dave Rhodes said about you? This was going on. This is all printed out. It was a fun little prank. It snowballed. And the big community fight. And it, it ended. Marcus had had some photo. He took me, I fell asleep. I was judging a bit of that weather. He took a photo of me falling asleep. I said, well, I'm temperature 103. I was on 18 hour light delays in zero. I was judging mid Atlantic. I was in the best position. He passed this around. This is where the pranks got to be a little bit hostile. Well, he went on stage to introduce the top 20. He got the nastiest. And I've been in major league stadiums, watched 60,000 people boo a bad call, you know, by an umpire. You want to allow booing crap go to Cincinnati when they're mad. <laughs> but this is pretty nasty because the personal people knew each other. Fans in the stands boo a bad call. People they've seen and been other people. People knew me, they knew Marcus. And Marcus is the one who got booed. I don't know, if I'd been up on the stage, I might have gotten that too. It wasn't a point of pleasant feeling. It got to the point that Chuck Ranzo even alluded to it in his address on the stage. So we realized this had to stop. Where this leads to is the good part. Marcus and I got the things settled, got stopped. There were the scars. They took my point. One person wanted to heal them, the other person doesn't apply. But the thing was healing. What the lesson of the community is as nasty as it is, that is, was, and as visible as it is, once there's something that's visible, it's harder to back down because people see it. You don't want to come across as weak or the person who's lost the thing, but you want to be fair. We were able for the whole community to get that thing back down. And the lesson is, we all have these feuds out there. It may not be as big and as visible as that, but those can be healed. And these people can be friends and allies and assets again, and you can be a friend of them and an asset to them too. It's all doable. So the tip, the, the bottom line, the ending is that it had a happy ending. How did you feel when Mr. Marcus passed away? It wasn't a shock because I knew how ill he was for some time. We knew, we knew for about a year that he'd been sick. And there's a couple of times he'd been in the hospital now. I knew this is beautiful. We know who then in 96. So it's like 14, 15 years later, that's a long time, you know. It's not like it was three weeks before. So we felt with a bond and there's a trust, there was a respect for each other. We knew what to say, something we would fight back. Now I just take, okay, that's fine. We're both in a competitive journalism, it's a competitive field. So if you go out there and go out there in the straight world and see what goes on in journalism, <laughs> be, a, be a photographer at a football team. And you guys getting run out of bounds on the photographer well, watch the watch the end of those plays next time you watch a football game if they don't cut away. You got guys kicking people's cameras into the guy and stuff. It's nasty. The stuff we have in this is nothing compared to what's out there. 
They'll take you out because you got 300,000 people on your job and we'll do anything to get it. So this is what we had just looked like it's just one hay bar going out to the ship, turning into something nasty. But nothing compared to what's out in the straight world out there. Not even close. So, I mean, Marcus, with respect, been there. There's a friendship that we started growing. And in that room, we, Mr. Marcus is something that's not going to be replaced. So well, how are you going to replace Mr. Marcus? And people come and say, oh, Dave Rhodes, you're the next to Mr. Marcus. I go, no, I'm not. Mr. Marcus is Mr. Marcus. I can't be him. He, people go, somebody out, um, last week at International's Letter, somebody out, one of the questions, somebody asked, how many people in the room have already been dished by Mr. Marcus when they're going to the world memorial? People had their hands were raised. Well, I raised two hands. <laughs> <laughs> and it was laughing about it, though. You know, people were having fun with that part. Everybody, just about everybody who's anybody had, had some kind of a chastisement there. Sometimes you were good. But that's his style. And I have my style. They're two different styles. So I can't be him. I'm not going to try to be Mr. Marcus. I mean, you can't. You have to be yourself. We don't. We know these contests. We judge people. We tell them when they're going to compete. Just be yourself. I can't go out there and do that and try to be somebody else. I've got to tell other people to be themselves. So, what has been the Leather Journal's impact on the community or the influence on the community over the years? I think a lot of people have gotten involved in the community because of it. Um, primary instance was um, realizing impact. Tar Heel Leather Club in um, North Carolina. There were guys living in Green, you know, Greenville or Greensboro, North Carolina. They'd been going to D.C., they were going around. They didn't know that there were three other leather clubs in North Carolina. They didn't even know they were there. The clubs had been around a long time. Didn't even know. One guy went to either the Alarm and Rising or something like that, and they bought a copy of Leather Journal, brought it back, and they found these other clubs. So what did they do? They all was here. They knew. They got this, they got in that club directly, they went to that. This club got down because one person saw it. And some of his friends were such starch. I mean, they were big families of clubs, went to these and saw, well, it's a bunch of leather clubs. They didn't even know what the club was until they found that. This is on their own, this is calling me for advice. They picked this up out of a store and went on their own to meet during friends club. Well, how many people have heard the name Jesse Helms? Okay, Tar Heel Leather Club instituted a fundraising drive to try to beat Senator Helms. The Helms was winning like 80% of the vote when he's winning his elections. In this election, where there was a beat Jesse campaign in Bay Area, the Tar Heel Leather Club had been started, and Jesse Helms won the election by about 5%, not 80%. So while they didn't win, they made an impact. And this is what so that one guy found it. And then it is a great feeling when you're um, out of town. I was um, actually I was going to New York, New York Mets baseball game, but it was New York. So I kind of went to Shades and see what's going on. So I got on the Senate train, leaving Manhattan down to uh, Queens, and um, two guys were talking. They were arguing about something that they saw in the Leather Journal. They didn't know who I was. I didn't know who they were. They didn't have a copy of the journal. They were talking about it. This two guys, I was getting off of something, but I didn't need to do with leather at all. I was there at a leather van and just found an evening where I get off. And here's two guys. So the impact is out there. It's, it's, the, it's kind of a neat thing when you have that happen. Well, in reverse, what's been the community's impact on the leather journal? Well, I mean, what I said earlier, was the um, founding of the other thing that was centered around information for clubs and news, and then with the involvement with the titles. I mean, as a news reporting agent, I report news. Sometimes I make news because they do the Pantheon Awards and we have an international limits contest. So in a way, I'm creating news that way. But something happens, we report on it. Have you ever refused to cover a story? Inside the leather community, I don't think I've refused because I don't like somebody. There's some issues that I've stayed away from. 
with the great financial wealth of William John Hass, I can afford 25 lawyers, right? <laughs> Not. So there are cases, if there's some legal thing going on there, somebody says something about somebody, it's often issued with actual events. They're having an event in Chicago or in Cincinnati or Atlanta or somewhere down in Florida. They're going to send the information, and I'm wanting to get that in. I don't have any reason to not put it in. But if it's something that said something about it, somebody been accused of something, and I think a lot of people report as fact. You find that a lot of facts come in and you find out they're not. And you put them in there, these people, Club A is bad, Club B. Club A sends an article to the Levin Chalmers, they send a vouch for The club has a vouch for an individual in that club or title system is vouch for it. I put that in the Levin Journal. I won't put myself up for liability. Then you find out what they said isn't true. And the percentage of things that you find out that people say about it is, you know, I have an good authority, community leaders, but I can't do the name, you know. So what's the biggest community scandal that the Leather Journal has covered? Hmm. We pretty much really have stayed out of, out of the scandals, you know. I did the thing with Mark, there's no more participant in that, so from that, that's probably the worst thing. That's part of it, so I mean, you yeah. know. But um, leading up to there's cases, some people have been accused of crimes, people have committed some crimes upon the community. We had some felony convictions. I just stayed away from the legal stuff. <coughs> well, one of the things about the Leather Journal is um, publishing um, a positive image of the Leather community. So, in a way, there's something called there's, uh, investigative journalism, which we are not. And one of the back of the is um, advocacy journalism. We're more like that. This is a letter to me. We're going to put the positive side of that out there to the best of our ability and knowledge. Well, let's talk a little bit about Pantheon of Leather and Olympus. What are those? Tell me a bit about them. Okay. The, the Pantheon of Leather Awards, we're going to have our 20th anniversary of that this year in Los Angeles in August. So um, it started in Los Angeles. Um, before we did the first award show in 91, I had been giving out some awards just like an editor can do. <coughs> Time Magazine's Man of the Year kind of thing, yeah. It was my opinion of who's what. My relations, of course, I mean the people that I meet because it means everybody. So I can say somebody is Man of the Year for the Leather Channel. And we five people later more qualified, but I had never met them before. So the scope of the Leather Journal at that time was smaller. Now we know more of the community. We still don't know all of it. So things are going to get missed, but it's a greater coverage of it. So in turning it into an award show, and some people in LA say, okay, they have the Oscars here. They have other events like that. Why not create an award thing for the other community? So we decided to do that. And the first two years was in Hollywood. Then um, I met um, at IML, R.J. Chapin, Gary Chichester, later Dean Overton. And um, we produced the event down at the Parliament House down in Florida one year. The crowd was a lot bigger than that, bigger than so we could have parked out for one place to party. The year after that, we did it in Houston. And then after that, it was in New Orleans for several years. And we'd probably still be doing the New Orleans today, but the cost of producing it and getting corporate sponsorship. When somebody doesn't pay a sponsorship, you can't go back to them next year. There's limited resources for that down there. So we're kind of, we're, you know, that's that we're running dry. An opportunity to get out of there was, was after 9-11, we had hotels reserved. 9-11 happens. They decided to move the Super Bowl to our weekend. Our hotels canceled. So folk, we've got a contract. Funds, assuming we need a response. Yeah. So we moved to Chicago at the time of Gary and Dean you know, over on The people in Chicago were incredible companies put that event on. I mean, the guys from LA is coming out, they're putting this thing on, but the IML research, and Robin, you worked on the IML too. It's been incredible working with that group. Some great people. And I found out that Gary 
Ridge High just was a bar tent on the Gold Coast. We heard the uh, Gold Coast of this bar from ages past, but it, it, I think it was gone by the time I came out. But these are some of these early founders, you know, working with them. They're great. RJ had gone back to buy a mill, I think that's terrific. Because RJ is just a great guy to work with. And to get an opportunity to work with him, there's a guy that's just a genuine nice guy. He's willing to help. You can make a mistake and he'll spot that rather than read you the right act. He'll find ways to fix it and move the thing on. And that's rare, because you're some people who make them, they're on the topic. And some of you are out there doing all this stuff, you're going to make mistakes. It's how you handle them. And that's what the people around you help you handle is And RJ helps you handle them. And the Olympus contest, the first we, um, the second year in the Pantheon, we uh, Luke Owens, who was my assistant editor at the time, the one who put in some of the bars, the extra bars and the markets, um, he found in what's the Southern California Master Slave Contest. And with our event, he turned that into the International Master Slave Contest, which this was connected to Pantheon at the time. In 96, he was like one other journal, one of these different things of life, turned the contest over to someone else. And for two or three years, that contest was kind of in limbo state. And, uh, but it was separate from Pantheon, and we didn't have it. So I came up with the idea of doing an international Olympus contest. The idea being that it was open to the whole community, men and women, het women, transgenders. They just had to be part of the community and they could enter the contest. Then um, we're doing the thing as a little contest to fix a little of our own looks oriented in some of the different categories. If you got a jock strap and you got a physique and muscles and all this, okay, these, these are what constitute 20 points. That's, you know, so you can have that. Some of the guys would never have a chance at some of these contests were able to run. And um, we did that, we started that in 96. And what the, what the contest has done, we've had Het men win, het women have won. Gay men, gay women. We've had MTFs, FTNs win. So it's not just for them, we've had two people who are, you know, are transgender in the contest at some time. We've actually had them, they have won. And so, you know, it's, it, though it has some, I believe it's right, well, it's not as large as the others. It's had to have intended impact on those people. I grabbed a title over here yesterday. Well, speaking of the contests a little bit, tell us what evolution you've seen through the contest circuit. How have things changed over the years? I think, uh, I mean, I now started, then you had the drummer contest start, and there's a primary two, then the National Leather Association, which is making a comeback now, they're trying to provide, they had the Mr. National. Mr. Mid's National Weather Association, which way you know, was a contest covered everybody too. So it was a predecessor to Olympus in the way that it was open to everybody. We're not the first one to do that, but NLA had stopped doing that. So we had kind of picked that up, not because they did that, it's something we decided to do anyway, but just as a bad for history's sake there, we're not making a claim that we're the first one for that. Straight on that, but um, the effects and the growth of it. Like, it's, um, now you're getting a lot of contests where you're getting one contestant or well, maybe three or four titles, and two of the contests don't even have representatives. And we have to take a look at that. What is the cause of that? Um, what do we need? Do we need to change? And if we need to change, what changes do we need to make? And there was a time a few years ago when uh, the Olympus contest was on a very shaky ground. And as I was looking at this problem, I said, you know, the Olympus could be part of this problem too. There's a lot of contests. My contest is part of that glut too. Should we bury it? And I was ready to say, you just use this, okay? And there's no way of stopping pulling back the Olympus a lot more that way. But um, internet has had some effect, of course. 
But if they can lend to conflict, they can blame everything on the internet. And yeah, that's part of the problem, but it's not necessarily the problem. In fact, the internet can be an ally for it. You can turn, you know, diversity into I mean, so for, for somebody to lose this, somebody else is going to win and pick it up. But the case is where we can lose, we can also be the winners of that. So I think we need to take a look at the systems, what we're recruiting, how we're recruiting contestants, what we expect of them. We need to take an inner look at what are our goals with the titles? How are the title holders treated? Is it something they would want to be? Why are they not? Why are people not running? And I don't think just the blood is the whole answer to that. I mean, a lot of contests need to take an inward look and see what they're doing. How are they treating the title holders? Are they capable of doing it for them? I mean, in the Olympus title, there's a lot of things we like to do with Olympus title holders that somebody is doing. We don't have the resource to do it. So I think we're against just in that. Speaking of title holders a little bit, what makes a successful title holder? Um, reaching a goal, achieving a goal, and what the goal of I know might be. What is the producer's goal? And what is the, the, the title holder's goal? Find out what those are. And what I know's goal might be might be different. International Leather Boys goal or Infos goal is. But are you when you when you set out to run a contest or compete in a contest, why are you competing? You get a question, um, if you become Mr. So and so or Miss So and so, what are you gonna do in the title? What is your goal? Well if you look at the end of the year and say, I either missed this goal, and by how much did you miss it? Or you reached a goal and then exceeded it. Did you reach your goal? Did you reach your goal? What was your producer looking for? Was your producer just nebulous and vague and didn't care? And the title is basically an advertisement for their establishment. And some are. And they're upfront about that. This is what their thing is. They want this. They want their bar or club or organization. Every time their title's out there with that name on it, that guy's advertising their place. In a way, it would seem that way, that's an expense of advertising. And some of them, that's the extent they're involved in it. They're upfront about that, usually. They'll, and then some people see the titles as all community service, all fundraising. And if you're doing that for your producer and for your community, but these are things that, what are your goals? Look at that, and your producer's goals, are you achieving? Well, what advice have you for people in the leather community today for a successful future in our community? Okay, the successful future. That, that, well, let's put the attorney mode on and say never goes in vain. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a you know, you know, Well, basically, in order to preserve the history, to preserve the culture, what advice have you for people in the leather community? Okay, we're talking about history. You got something you get ready to throw that out? Give it a second bud. Because that one thing if you throw away might be something that's an important link to something else. It's a copy of a leather journal, there's ten thousand of those printed every month. You throw a copy of that away, you're probably not hurting anybody. But some unique items. If every copy of the leather journal got thrown up, then we wouldn't have that, but there's so many. So from that aspect, one thing, you get more of the unique items, there's only one or two of them, you might have one of them. And you toss it. What items are about? You was going to cock ring, you know, something like that. You know, it might be a photo. And I think that's a lot of things. People take photos. I think we're missing today, too, I think, is print photos. People snap away. Here, I got tons of photos. Most of these photos are going to get deleted. They get saved on a file. The repetitions of them are deleted. In the early days, the Leather Journal, about halfway through, we were using print film. I've got enough to fill boxes 
call it about four feet high to cover half that back wall back there. I've actually put some photographs. I've got those saved. Um, I kept all of them in the way of a pack rat and that. So everybody can't be pack rats. I mean, they don't have all those kind of photos. But you have an item, you attended a contest, maybe you got an award, or, or even a recognition maybe you didn't get the main award, but you got a nomination certificate from your local letter club. On the bike club, you decide, okay, we've got someone so on this, and here's the first seat, the secondary thing. Secondary thing, okay, so people might talk that. Well, your life has gone on, two years later, it's taken to the crack, you become a IML. And you've got this history, then we two or three years lose you for some reason. And some of the stuff's been thrown out. You don't know what's coming from that or next. We're, we're, we're all in this room today. Two years, some of us may not be here. Five years, some of us. Ten, twenty years, certainly some of us are not going to be here. But we don't know when that's going to be. So having all the, not only having it, that's one step. And what us realizing the value of it is, is if you haven't turned that into the leather archives or on your local like historical societies, there's no record of that. You pass on, you get in a car wreck, both the family's in there, there's a jump, 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 toss, 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 toss. And this is all the stuff that's valuable. You lost control. So who makes the decision on what's valuable and what's not? And that's probably a huge people we've lost. Somebody else is coming in and interpreting that. Unless it's somebody that's in the community, whether that's a mother, master, sir, daddy, or whatever, or friends from a club have gotten there, somebody else that does not know much about, knows nothing about them, part of the love of life, or thinks leather is such a sin, and this is who do Jesus as well and throw all the stuff out to glorify God or whatever, you know. But the bottom line is, the stuff is getting thrown. They might have some great pictures from the Satyrs run that nobody else took. Or they might have had some awards that they were proud of, but their family they were just disgusting. That's tossed and gone. So, making preparations, because you don't want to, you have something, you don't want to give away the leather archives time. It's time when they have it. But that award, that sash, or whatever that you have, there's a time that you have a value for that. And while that's in your custody, you have a responsibility with that. Well, I'd like to conclude with a question that uh, if I don't ask, I'll never be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about your fetishes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my primary fetish is more like BDSM, I like bondage. And so I'm a sweat loving pig. I'm a white hot sweaty guy. It's too hot. That I enjoy. Okay. That's a primary. That's gonna trigger me up and send taste of guys and take me a lot further than we're just playing some Plug. But I do, I like a lot of them. There's a variety of the s and that I enjoy. Um, they're very tactile, lots of tactile play. Um, some bonded. There are probably more things I'm into than not. There are very few things I'm extremely heavy into, but there's more of a variety of them. I like more of a small explorer. There's a few things I haven't done. There's some things I like that I can't do because of a heart problem that I had three years ago. Like some of the heavier electric fly that I like. Now I have to limit that to like my alarm fly. So there. Okay. Well, I would like to thank you very much, Dave. This has been a very good experience for everyone, and I'd like to thank everyone who was able to attend. Thank you very much. Thank you.